Hello, welcome to week 10, where we will be exploring a history of the image in Southeast Asia. We will be exploring this as a technical or technological field, as well as, as an aesthetic or a theoretical field, thinking alongside the question of what kind of power resides in the image, and also what do images do in this context. So beside epigraphic records carved onto stones, the earliest forms of writing exist in the medium of palm leaf manuscript. Um, of course, um, not many of the early of this survive, especially in the tropical climate. Um, but the palm leaf manuscript tradition is a very conservative tradition. The format does not change, uh, although the script has evolved. It adapts itself to the changes in the language and the scripts. Um, so typically, a, the format exists as a long, narrow strip, and these are called folios. They're bound together with a cord and protected by wooden covers, and these are called the porti format. So the palm leaf manuscripts older than 14th century are kind of rare. Oldest extent uh, of these types of manuscripts uh, exist only because uh, certain climatic conditions has allowed uh, for the conservation of these manuscripts and these would not have existed in the tropical condition of Southeast Asia. Rather, uh, the oldest extent of the palm leaf manuscript fragments survive in an area like Torfan in Central Asia and these date back to the second century common era. So dating the manuscripts, however, are always a problematic signs because not all manuscripts have colophones and when you study manuscripts, uh, the word colophon uh, are basically sections that tells you who is the author, and very often this is not stated, uh, but it's also information of where the information comes from. It's a bit of a, uh, almost like a publisher comment uh, telling you what is the origin of the source of the information. Uh, typically, in the palm, how you make palm leaf manuscript is that fresh leaves are collected and dried uh, from either of these uh, uh, palm trees that you see uh, on the screen here, and they are being first collected, dried, uh, before being boiled in water or milk. They are then buried in wet sand for about three months to give them the softness. Again, they are dried again, and then a uh, type of oil is applied to create a smooth surface. Finally, the surface is again smoothened once more uh, with the use of polished stone or conch shell. Uh, palm leaves, uh, um, manuscripts, uh, when you write on it, they are typically inscribed with a metal or bone or ivory styluses. So it's a thin, uh, 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 sharp, uh, instrument where you sort of like almost carve onto the surface of the palm leaf manuscript itself. Uh, so a paste is normally used to then highlight or to bring out the incised word. In essence, it's a type of relief that you carve onto the surface of the palm leaf. Uh, the recipe used uh, to create this highlight is usually a paste uh, made up using powdered charcoal or a, a, or a type of soot uh, mixed with gum and water or oil. As you can see with the relief of a bodhisattva holding onto a manuscript carved uh, into the Borobudo Stupa monument from the 9th century AD, uh, that the palm leaf manuscript is very closely associated with the dissemination of Buddhist text within the Sanskrit cosmopolis. And this was the chief format uh, which helped to circulate Buddhist knowledge um, all over uh, domains and territories that came under the cultural influence of Buddhism. So because palm leaf manuscripts are not objects that last uh, very often, it's also remediated on some level uh, in other mediums, such as gold. Uh, so you can see here on the screen, uh, 4th or 5th century uh, uh, approximation uh, in the form of uh, gold uh, 
called the Kimba Golden Manuscript with a Pali text of uh, you know a Buddhist formula called uh, or centered on the doctrine of dependent arising that was excavated from a relic chamber uh, of the Kimba Stupa in central Myanmar. Similarly, uh, we see this in a much later Balinese letter on gold. Uh, with its proportion, uh, the letter emulates also the piece of palm leaf. And this was the standard writing material throughout Southeast Asia before the wide availability of paper. Of course, it's still used uh, to uh, record sacred knowledge in Bali today. Uh, the use of gold as a writing material uh, actually dates back very long in Southeast Asia. And so, for example, in the National Museum in Jakarta, we have examples of Buddhist texts in Sanskrit from the 10th century uh, inscribed on gold strips similar to the size of the Balinese letter and comparable to the Buddhist gold inscriptions that uh, we see here on the screen, the Kinva gold manuscript. Uh, so gold was also used for diplomatic letters and its use can in many ways be interpreted as a way to honor the recipient while also emphasizing the status of the sender. Uh, in its use uh, in diplomatic letters, therefore we see a golden letter perhaps um, uh, as a, uh, an indication that it, when diplomatic letters were written, they were not written written from one private individual to another individual. Rather, they take on a public uh, function uh, and there are ceremonies attached to the reception, uh, to the sending off, as well as to the uh, reading of the content as well. Uh, so there's a very ceremonial, uh, theatrical uh, quality to even an object like a diplomatic letter. Many of these letters have survived principally because uh, they're kept in European archives. And an exceptional example is this example of a Burmese letter on gold uh, uh, sent to George II of Great Britain in 1756. Uh, so something of this uh, tradition of using gold then survived into also the Malay letter writing tradition. Uh, so. Uh, very often, when it is done this way, a letter is written on what is called a kertas emas, or a golden letter. But more often than not, uh, a golden letter really means that the letter is decorated with gold paint. Right? Uh, so you would have to listen emas, uh, being the word used to describe what this uh, uh, decorative quality is like. So uh, the word Tulis uh, versus surat is important to highlight here because um, uh, when you use the word tulis in the past, it really means a process in which you uh, decorate something uh, and illustrate something or create patterns of, whereas the word surat refers to writing uh, itself. Uh, so the decorated frames that you see here up on the screen, as well as the various borders that segments the illuminated letters, were known as jida and sometimes demarcated into compartments called kandam. So the art itself is often uh, called parada and it's, uh, the word parada seems to be a descriptor for a wide range of gold ornamentation. So uh, some of the Sha'i references uh, suggest patterns were stamped on gold leaf or foil, other gold, gold inlays or met on metal, while many others can be mean tracery in liquid gold. Uh, parada also occurs in old Javanese to mean gold leaf, derived from the Sanskrit parada, meaning quicksilver. Uh, so what you see here, that there is also the use of cloth ornamented with gold, such as kain parada in Java and Bali, or kain telopo in the Malay Peninsula. Parasols are also embellished with gold foil silk, common in Bali, and the embroidered bed hangings of cloth called the langit, and gold tinsels found in Malay areas are also forms of brada, and therefore the ornamentation of uh, paper are uh, part of this larger tradition of uh, adding bling with the use of 
gold, and there's a real love for gold in the Malay world. So in some of these letters that you are seeing on the screen, gives you an idea that perhaps something of the past uh, with the use of golden letter in the form of palm leaf manuscript did survive. Uh, it's a static sensibility, did survive even into uh, uh, the widespread use of paper as the primary medium and material uh, uh, through which uh, information uh, is being conveyed. So what did the word tulis serve? When we use the word tulis in the past, uh, it didn't mean writing as what it means today. Of course, today, since writing uh, began as a calligraphic art, possessing qualities that are associated uh, with illustration, uh, therefore, perhaps the word today, tulis, uh, evolved to exclusively mean writing. But the older usage persists in the description of a hand-drawn batik. Uh, so it's a uh, hand-drawn batik. It's today still called batik tulis. Uh, uh, however, when it comes to writing in the past, penmanship uh, was described with the word menurat, uh, which came from the root word surat, or the letter. Right? Uh, so when we use the word tulis, very often we connect it to the idea of illustrating in a decorative or graphic manner. There's a strong emphasis on pattern making and abstraction. Uh, therefore, a tulisan takes the form of a pola, a bunga-bungaan, or an awan, or maga, which is a cloud. So the bunga-bungaan are flowers, awan are clouds, and pola means model. So you can see on the screen here, the, on the lower left corner, the mega mendong. This is a uh, a well-known coastal batik design created in one of the workshops that's in the north part of Java, the sea-facing part, which is connected to uh, other port cities in, across Southeast Asia and also to the south of China, uh, where it adopted uh, the Chinese motif of the Ruyi cloud into what is called a batik pola, a um, model. Typically, I think the word model here suggests that there is a unit that then gets repeated over and over again uh, to produce a uh, infinitely extendable uh, feel or, or surface that is decorated. And this is not limited to uh, the process of tulis or, or illustration by means of uh, to create a decorative or, or graphic form uh, it, uh, in uh, the use of uh, to create polas. Uh, you can also use other techniques such as weaving or carving, as you can see on the screen here with the songket uh, uh, textile, as well as the carving of a lotus flower uh, uh, for a uh, for a lelangit or the ceiling panel of a lecture pulpit in a mosque in, from Kelantan. In all of these examples, what you get a sense of, whether it's called a pola or a model, or a bunga or a flower, or an awan or a mega or cloud, uh, they consist of a singular uh, pattern unit, uh, often taking a floral or natural uh, uh, inspired abstracted form which then fills up the entire decorated surface. So uh, in Southeast Asia, when it comes to the use of paper and book binding in uh, the modern style, uh, it's often associated with the spread of Islam and therefore uh, post 14th century. Uh, but really the oldest known Malay manuscript that has survived today uh, is uh, a Sufi text which dates to the end of the 16th century, so end of 1500s. Uh, and there are a few Malay manuscripts dating from the 17th century, uh, so from 1600, but really this is a very tiny pool. Uh, so, uh, and most of them are of course kept in Europe. Uh, uh, so if you look at our collection at the uh, Prapustaka Negara, unfortunately the dating are questionable, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, most of them you would find actually date to the, dates to the 19th century. Uh, of course, this is due to the difficulty of preserving paper materials in our tropical condition. Uh, although this is so, uh, very often uh, scholars or researchers could infer uh, often from the study of the language and, and, and through comparison of many, many different uh, uh, manuscripts, um, scholars are able to infer from the content that maybe the content dates to an earlier period. Uh, so the earliest documents, as I said, Often survived in the form of letters addressed by Malay rulers to European, which, while interesting, really belongs to a separate class uh, of objects or, or genres to the very few manuscripts that were actually in use in the Malay speaking world. So, uh, generally, uh, uh, illus uh, illuminated manuscript book uh, takes the uh, connected to uh, religious books. And an illuminated manuscript book uh, uh, in the Malay language is often called a kitab keemasan. So to illuminate a book or a letter with gold ink was to manulis uh, dengan ai emas, or to write with uh, uh, liquid gold, or to manulis dengan perada, or di perada dengan ai emas. Uh, in the use of codology, uh, which is the study of manuscripts, uh, since the 17th century at least, uh, it's important to pay attention to uh, the, each physical sheet uh, of the manuscript. And uh, this is where uh, paying attention to the information uh, or the caption provided uh, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the library is important because each physical sheet of the manuscript is numbered. And this is the number that is often uh, written as F3V or 4R to 4R, as you see on the screen. So in codology, a manuscript is called a folium, and that's what the F stands for. Uh, and uh, each page is then uh, annotated as either belonging to the rectum sign or the versum sign. Uh, abbreviated as R and V respectively. So this marks the position of the text in the original manuscript. Therefore, page 3 of the physical sheet is marked in the form of volume 3 V, as you can see on the screen here. Uh, since um, some of the finest examples of manuscript art from the Malay world are really not found in literary historical or legal manuscripts written in the Malay language. Uh, and there's reason for that. Uh, however, uh, you would find that the bulk of the illuminated manuscripts are in Qurans and other religious works, mainly written in Arabic. Uh, that, therefore, uh, this is typically where you would find different regional schools of Southeast Asian Islamic manuscript art. Uh, on this basis of the shape or the structure of the decorated frames and the palette and the ornamental motifs used, uh, it's often possible now to begin identifying the origin of the Quran manuscript uh, from Southeast Asia, whether it is from Aceh or Tunganu or Patani or, or Java or even Mindanao. So while it's uh, uh, we are able to securely identify regional schools of Quranic illumination. Uh, many of the literary manuscripts uh, that exist uh, do not actually confirm, conform themselves to uh, this grouping. Uh, and therefore, uh, what this shows is that there exists two very different textual traditions. Another point to make is that if there, it, uh, the literary manuscripts such as the Hikayat is ever decorated, they do not uh, necessarily need to uh, conform to a convention, a decorated convention. And what this also suggests is that for the religious text, uh, it tends to be, uh, how you decorate a religious text, it tends to be quite conservative. It needs to sort of like conform to a particular standard, to a particular school. Uh, that has its own artistic criteria. So what you have on the screen here, for example, is typical of the Patani uh, 
school and it includes elements such as the interlocking wave arches uh, on both the vertical side and at the top and bottom of the frame uh, and it composed of really of two intersecting arts mounted by an ogival dome and a small border uh, when you look closely of uh, little ornamented details of chili peppers or chili paddy and seeds. Uh, so there's also something very whimsical in the decorative quality of all these frames as you look closely for all the little details. Uh, something that's very relishing in discovering uh, some of these uh, minute and fine little ornamental details that seems to uh, serve the purpose of sparking discovery and, in, and inviting close looking. So the reason for this discrepancy may lie in the differing perception of the status of religion and literary manuscripts in the Malay world. Manuscripts of the Quran and religious texts uh, recognized to contain uh, spiritual teachings, enduring and unchanging word of God, typically in Islam as Part of the rite of passage of becoming a true Muslim is one's capacity to read the Quran. Uh, so reading here often refers to a recitation. So even if you don't know how to uh, uh, know the content or the actual meaning in Arabic, you can at least recite the Arabic text. Uh, uh, and, and, and to be able to recite the Quran fully marks your entry into the Ummah or the community of Islam. Therefore, if sight is so central and, and beholding the manuscript or the Quran or the holy book is so central to Muslim culture, uh, ornamentation therefore plays a much larger role uh, in uh, its, uh, the, how it's being used in uh, uh, Quran and other religious texts. Uh, how this is because uh, the written text itself was deemed to have an intrinsic value and therefore we find illumination uh, takes on a much larger role but in a very prescriptive and conformist way to fulfill a functional purpose. Uh, they exist typically as decorated frames announcing the opening and closing words of the holy book while there are also marginal ornamentations guiding the reader to standard divisions of the text. And so the, the people don't deviate very much from these formats. On the other hand, the Malay literary works are composed principally for oral delivery. They come alive when being recited aloud and when being listened to or with the beautiful sounds of a, a sang sha'in or narrative poems. Uh, and these are enjoyed as what is called halwa telinga. Literally, uh, literally it means the uh, the sweet meats uh, for the ear uh, uh, or a, a sweetener for the ear. Uh, there was thus very little sense of permanence attached to any particular written manifestation of a literary work. So, in, in fact, Malay scribes conventionally exhort their, uh, exhort their successors to correct and improve the text in front of them. Perhaps this is why literary manuscripts uh, were not traditionally deemed to merit illustration. And if there were decorations, such as this very early Hikayat Suri Rama, it is occasionally uh, used uh, to, uh, and supplied at the whim of the individual scribe or at the behest of the client. And uh, in this instance, it's probably a European client uh, that requested uh, for the manuscript to have an uh, illumination frame attached to the opening of the hikayat that he ordered. So a glaring absence when it comes to traditional Malay texts uh, of perhaps the, the most common artistic term used today is uh, the word lukis, right, which we come to mean paint or draw in today's context. Uh, so uh, the word Lucas can, however, be found in the Malay language, uh, Minangkabau, as well as Javanese languages. In Java, the term Ang Lucas was used to describe a form of image making. The Java manuscript Tantu Pangelaran tells the story of the Patara Guru, and this is the incarnation of the god uh, of the Hindu god Shiva, 
who is very commonly evoked uh, if you look at even Malay magic manuscripts. Uh, and it tells the story of how the Patara Guru instructed a number of gods to descend upon the Java Islands to teach the people of Java various kinds of knowledge. And knowledge here is called Kapandayan. And this is the historical word for, the, for, for what we call knowledge in this part of the world. Uh, panda, it comes from the root word pandai, which is a form of cleverness or wisdom. And when you sort of uh, add in the suffix, uh, it signifies that this, this, this knowing how to do something results in a kind of knowledge. So among those who heeded the instruction uh, was a demigod or a deva who received the following instruction. Uh, so create an image, O Bhagawan Chipta Gupta. Compose a wonderful form based on that which appears in your mind with the use of your thumb. Thereby you will be known as Lord Chiptankara, the image maker. Uh, in a uh, art theorist uh, analysis, uh, his name is San Sanento Yuliman. He notes that the word Lucas here is used in the context of an undertaking that involves the creation of something that did not exist prior into an evocative form that originates in one's chipta, through one's chipta. Chipta here translates as uh, one's mind, idea, or imagination. This was realized in turn with the thumb, which allows the tools uh, to be used to create something to be gripped by the hand. The example here suggests that when knowledge is seen through the qualities of a Kapandayan, Kapandayan's concept of what it means to know is predicated on giving form or shape to what one imagines. And it's really quite unlike the prevailing modern day division between thinking and doing. So instead, the very act of thinking or imagination itself is ultimately predicated on the physical dexterity uh, of, uh, of, a, of a craftsman or an artist to create an attractive or evocative image from what appears in one's mind. And this is uh, the gamba or the putta, the, the word used to mean picture with a representational or evocative quality. Uh, okay? uh, what you see here on the screen is that uh, when we look at something, it doesn't need to be in the form that is limited to a 2D object. You can also look at a patong, a 3D form, or a sculpture, right? Uh, uh, as, as this uh, Majapahit era Ganesha statue excavated in Sarawak uh, near Kuching shows. Uh, so, uh, however, uh, in using the word Lukisan, uh, while it is uh, very uh, uncommonly used, uh, there are examples that exist in the text itself. So you need to sort of, um, if you want to figure out how uh, specific words are being used in the past, uh, there's this thing called the concordance. It's not a dictionary. It's a type of, um, it's a type of dictionary that allows you to search the word but also tracks how words are being used at specific point in history. So there's of course the Chinese concordance project, there's also the English one, uh, then there's the Malay concordance project which you can search on Google, and it's a, web, uh, it's a type of like uh, dictionary that people use to track uh, not just how words are being used in specific context, but also track the changes of meaning uh, uh, of specific words over a period of time. And what the concordance show us is that uh, when it comes to a word like Lucas, uh, very often it's used in very specific contexts, uh, such as uh, uh, to give, uh, uh, to speak about the sort of like effective power that the mimetic images uh, have on human beings. So uh, when we think of a gambar or a portrait, it's imbued with lifelike qualities through the skill of Malukas. Uh, and at some point, it, assuage, it helps to assuage human longing or serve as a substitute for a person. A gambar can also be used to garner sympathy 
And, and in many ways, uh, when you think of a lukisan, therefore, a portrait, it's implicitly tied to the larger question of its usefulness. Uh, more than the image, I think it also hints at what descriptive illustration could potentially do. And therefore, it's also seen as something that is rather dangerous. In general, there is a, a tradition that generally proscribes or forbids uh, rep the common use of a wide circulation of representational image, principally because it's uh, of this sort of like affective dimension. However, uh, having said that, the evocative uh, power of the image tends to in many ways be remediated uh, in a textual form. Uh, and this textual tradition uh, survives not only as a uh, something that you read on the pages of a manuscript, uh, this textual tradition is also a literary culture that connects and expands outwards towards an auditory realm, meaning what you hear, uh, auditory as in what, uh, the, 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 it's, a sphere, it's a sphere that is connected to one soundscape, right? So the hikayat itself it's, uh, a, uh, is often not something that is read, uh, it is something that is heard. So uh, a famous uh, example is that uh, uh, on the eve of the fall of the Malacca Sultanate in 1511, uh, the, uh, as the Portuguese were about to sort of like invade Malacca, uh, it is noted in the Sajara Malayu, uh, for example, the night before the attack, uh, the young uh, warriors of Malacca uh, went, approached the Sultan. Uh, requesting the recitation of the Hikayat Muhammad Hanafiya. However, um, because uh, the Sultan wanted to test their resolve, he instead offered uh, a tale of a lesser hero, the Hikayat Amir Hamza. And these are uh, uh, stories uh, connected to the early uh, foundational years of Islam. Uh, and, and they take on, therefore, a new role repurpose as tales of moral courage. In fact, uh, uh, as they are used and repurposed in uh, the Malay recitational uh, hikayat tradition, uh, they not only uh, serve the purpose of uh, encouraging uh, martial courage or uh, instill uh, values of what it means to be a good spiritual warrior uh, uh, as it participates within an auditory culture the use of sound also stirs one into action and therefore plays a role in stirring in one's mind what one is obligated or is supposed to do there is something transformational in uh, the way uh, a gambaran uh, is used or a mental picture is being used in this context. Uh, so not all of it is connected to uh, uh, a central authority or, or uh, a control over a, a, a top-down sort of like control or assertion of power. Many of these hikayats, in fact, uh, operate from a bottom-up kind of uh, Competition. Uh, so one of the earliest hikayat uh, is known as the hikayat Belando Janaka. It definitely dates before the 17th century, and uh, it is uh, perhaps uh, preserving an older still tradition. Uh, of course, uh, what's delightful about this hikayat is that it's really an uncomfortable reminder that it's always been a, a political and ideological struggle in the Malay world, and you have to read this productively next to the Sajara Malayu, which is an assertion of royal legitimacy and prerogative, as well as authority. If Daulat is reinforced through uh, the Sajara Malayu and its version of the compact between the Raja and the Rakyat, or the king and the commoner, is something that is described as a, a, a pact, uh, 
that spells out uh, you know what are the duties that one uh, the, the king owes to the common people and the common people to the king and uh, uh, in exchange for you know absolute authority and rule uh, uh, the king has certain sort of like duties to the uh, people uh, however it also meant that uh, the people cannot rebel against the king uh, I think the Hikaya of Lando Chanaka tries to uh, subvert and question uh, uh, this particular compact by looking at this thing through a very cynical lens. It also in many ways challenged our contemporary nostalgia industry, uh, especially a very middle class pretension that wanted to view our uh, key idea of the, uh, you know, the monarchy through a rosy lens, right? Uh, so the Hikayat here really serves as a uncomfortable reminder that there has always been political and ideological struggles in the Malay world and that the common folk of the old days were not always credulously in awe of their rulers. And this is told through the tale of the mouse deer. So if the mouse deer today is seen as a cute little character in children's folk tale that is often wily and cunning, but is almost like an underdog figure, uh, the mouse deer that is in the Hikayat uh, is much more strategic and cunning because uh, the story is really about his ambition uh, to become the ruler of the forest. Uh, so the story really talks about his exploits, uh, how he tricks different animals into accepting his authority. Uh, and therefore, the premise of this hikayat is really, uh, in a sense, how royal power rests on a kind of false consciousness. So while it is a story about uh, how clever and cunning this uh, mouse deer is in tricking all the different animals into submission, uh, it, as a story itself, it illustrates how a gullible public really can be made to think that they need this figure of authority and this can be done through a combination of religious fraud and uh, providing a false sense of security. And what it does is that it reveals this underlying ideological structure of the Malay world through a story that is highly episodic and cyclical in structure. So uh, there's a constant use of stock phrases that connects to um, ideas and expressions that are familiar to the listener, but the text is also lively in the sense that uh, because it is about a deception, uh, the, this thread of deception runs, the, uh, runs in the story on two levels. First, the audience are invited to share a reality with the mouse deer, uh, and then they are also uh, made aware of the sham uh, that is uh, used on the forest animals, with room for doubting whether they have uh, that they, they have the distinction right way around. Right, uh, the mouse deer is really never quite far away from an alterian motif. So uh, when the mouse deer appeal to fair play and morality as he promotes this deceit is, uh, is narrated or is shared, the forest creatures therefore are also unaware and the audience is allowed to view the scene as if it's from two perspectives simultaneously and they understand both the forest creatures ignorance and the mouse deer's cunning and by simultaneously seeing both sides of the coin they co-locate themselves with the author in a third meta perspective. And this multiple perspective have both ideological and literary implications. So as the audience are invited to experience the story concurrently from both the mouse deer's view and from the forest creature's view, so that when the mouse deer sort of like calls a witness to watch closely, but at the wrongdoings, the, the, all the wrong things, the audience, as if they know the story, can really savor the irony. Or if they do not know the story, or choose to suspend the memory of it, uh, they can then also wrestle with the mouse deer's every word in the knowledge that nothing he says 
can be taken at face value. So there's a kind of intellectual pleasure here, a kind of like complicit knowing and how the story will progress as we see from the perspective of, of both sides uh, uh, really, uh, uh, really uh, brought to life by a kind of black hum humor and, uh, and, and a desire to entertain the possibility that the, the dangerous ideas of the, that the mouse, mouse fear personifies are actually uh, ways, cultural practices and political systems that are much closer to home uh, than one would be allowed to discuss openly. So in this shifting and clever uh, exploitation of the, 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 the very orality of the medium, uh, you know, it plays with uh, the different types of awareness that one can inhabit, right? So the dimensions that one could inhabit include the double awareness uh, that uh, you can share with the perspective of the omniscient uh, author or the storyteller, but as a listener, you can also identify with the forest animals uh, who is the, whose false consciousness they share in real life. So older versions of this story does tend to be, it's not a kind of direct political satire and it eats at one in a more corrosive level and, and speaks to a, a foundational issue within Malay society. And this way we can think of the gambaran uh, at work in an auditory culture as cultivating thinking. And thinking is cultivated through the, through the use of evocative imagery, even though in the textual form it remediates the purpose and power of the image in the, the textual account uh, uh, that describes true imageries. So therefore, the relationship between the text and the image is not as always clear-cut as uh, what we like to think of it in today's context, right? Uh, so uh, another example we can point to uh, is from Java. Uh, so the book typically in Javanese manuscript tradition opens and closes with two facing element, illuminated pages. And these are often polychrome uh, gilded patterns, uh, and they're in the Javanese tradition, they're called the Wadana. Uh, so as illuminations, uh, the, the Javanese tradition tend to have uh, a much uh, larger variation of patterns, colors, and format, and also much more uh, uh, richly decorated. Uh, so typically, the two illuminations at the beginning of the book are at the same, and those at the end are also the same, uh, while these two sets of illuminations differ from one another, as you can see on the screen here. So in the Malay world, uh, the illumination is normally created after the text is written, was written, and usually by a different person. So while the pages uh, of this manuscript is fully illuminated. In many other manuscripts, you can also find that texts are written in blocks much smaller than the page, and, theref uh, and therefore, and, and then you don't see an illumination there. It therefore suggests that illuminations were uh, either abandoned or never made for some reason. Uh, so, uh, when representational images are included in books, and these are perhaps much more common in Japanese texts, again, uh, a lot of them come from a much later period as well, closer to the 19th century. If book culture is centered on recitation, the gambar that is being deployed or used here are very often not always naturalistic forms of representation. They are graphic forms of evocation to aid one to produce a mental picture of the narrative, uh, such as the one that you see here on the screen. Perhaps it's difficult to really uh, understand this idea of scale when we tell the story of Dewa Ruchi uh, tell, uh, as he tells the tale of Bhima, who is ordered by the sage Drona to procure the holy water of life. Uh, uh, however, this is a ploy by the sage to get rid of Bhima, uh, who he feared is too powerful and will thus become a formidable adversary 
uh, of the sage royal patron, the, the king, uh, in the final battle uh, uh, that is the great war in the famous Indian epic, the Mahabharata, right? Uh, so this story found its way to Java sometime in the 10th century. So in order to obtain the holy water, Bhima had to travel far and wide, and typically Javanese stories are stories of tales of exploits during one's travel and adventure. And in one episode, he plunged into the deep sea, deep ocean, where he finally meets his mystical self in the form of Dewa Ruchi. And what you see here is therefore a depiction of that encounter uh, who instructs him uh, in the meaning of life and many other philosophical and ethical matters. And that's where the teaching, the central sort of like message on moral of the story uh, comes in. And in this sort of like, in this graphical manner, what you get a sense is that relying on certain conventions uh, and ideals of uh, form, uh, the story itself uh, is uh, visualized uh, in a representational form, right? So the gamba serves the purpose here of helping us to produce a mental picture of what this encounter might look like. It is not an encounter of equal. If Bhima is meeting his mystical self in the form of a Dewa Ruchi, he is seeing the Dewa. The Dewa is depicted much larger and in a much sort of like refined form than uh, uh, Bhima himself who is uh, shown to be much more reduced in scale and if you were to zoom in closely you would also see that uh, the features are different in the, sen in the sense that the, as a dewa in, uh, uh, this, uh, he much more closely resembles some of the prince or royal aristocratic characters in the wayang puppet uh, in wayang puppetry uh, and therefore is uh, considered as much more hollows or refined, whereas Bhima is a lot more bulbous, he's more rounded, and therefore more common uh, in its physical manifestation. And the, the use of scale then would also give you an idea of uh, how they operate on, you know, different hierarchical register uh, between the common or the coarse uh, to uh, what is considered as refined or sacred and holy. Part of this process uh, to a uh, uh, true uh, graphic or representational no means this evocative practice stems from this concept of uh, cultivation, right? And cultivation is often connected to the taman uh, or the garden, and so in. Uh, in Malay literary tradition, uh, the Taman uh, connected, of course, to the Islamic concept of the paradisal, uh, it, it's a paradisal sort of like space. It can be physical uh, as a space, but it's also a space to cultivate uh, oneself uh, spiritually uh, and morally, and therefore also socially on many levels. And it is in the Taman that one enters into uh, a state of pleasure and you arrive at this stage or you achieve this state of pleasure uh, principally through self-cultivation and with uh, knowledge being the key of such achievement. So in many ways there is an aesthetic dimension to this because in hearing or in seeing or beholding uh, an image or in hearing an image one is also uh, recognizing that the fact that images, in, whether in its auditory form or in its visual form, uh, operates within the register of pleasure. It's meant to excite and there is a, a strong aesthetic dimension, a sense perception dimension uh, to how knowledge can be earned or achieved. Okay, uh, so uh, and very often, this knowledge is not the kind of uh, obsession with um, um, uh, categories that has primarily uh, defined uh, Western knowledge systems since the 18th century. Rather, it is in many ways uh, uh, encompassing and syncretistic 
So we can see this in some of the illustrations, uh, such as the story of Celerasa. It's part of a manuscript with 163 illustrated pages. Uh, so it's a very richly illustrated manuscript uh, using the iconography of Japanese Wayan puppet theater, the Wayan Kulit, uh, that you uh, as some of the main figures. And these are characters drawn in the three-quarter profile with angular shoulders and long, thin, jointed lips. And, uh, and the, the Wayang Kulit sort of like uh, uh, characters are often used to depict some of the more aristocratic uh, personalities. And, and these are very often stylized, exemplifying ideals of beauty uh, that are considered to be halos or refined. Uh, then there are also servants or from the lower classes that are drawn in a much more comic manner with rounded faces and bodies that would uh, correspond to uh, uh, how it's being depicted in the Wayang Kulit the tradition as clown figures. So like other stories of daring do and travels, uh, Celerasa is a story about the Prince of Champa and his two brothers who are often, uh, like in many stories, forced to leave their, leave their kingdoms after you know, uh, their elder brother or someone in the family usurped the throne and treated them with disdain. And therefore, they undergo many adventures and trials. Uh, so in one episode, you see the two brothers setting sail from Champa uh, to uh, somewhere else in the middle of the night. Uh, but however, note that the Dutch flag flying from the ship uh, that you can see up here, uh, and, and, it, and such anachronism, uh, that means weaving in modern details and elements uh, uh, that are very specific to uh, 19th century uh, and projected it back in time are common features in Japanese manuscript art in the sense that these anachronism are perhaps indication of a worldview, an approach to seeing the world that do not see the past and the present as distinct set of time units or, or periods uh, that are separated by gulfs and a need to identify uh, uh, the correct iconography specific to that time, rather in combining them and amalgamating them, uh, one uh, sees uh, the activation of this story or this knowledge uh, in the present context of the early 19th century. It comes alive again. Uh, so history has certain uses and remembering how it's being sort of like used in the context of the 19th century and uh, is equally as uh, important as trying to understand uh, the different ways the story has evolved uh, from uh, you know uh, an older sort of history so um, uh, if you know uh, iconographies of sort of uh, the, the Dutch flag uh, from the ship is one visible example that uh, the text is also drawing in contemporary references from the 19th century. We shouldn't forget that uh, 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 it's drawing from multiple streams as well. It's drawing references from multiple streams and this includes the presence of holy men such as uh, uh, this Arab religious figure that you see Prince Celerasa kneeling before. Uh, well, and, uh, and this takes on a much more dreamlike uh, quality in that uh, it is described in the text that uh, this holy man, Kianu Sayyid, it's a Sayyid, uh, who is a descendant of the Prophet, uh, meditated, stayed in a place for so long, neither eating nor drinking, but smelling flowers and praying to God, and that a vine has grown up all around the body. and. Uh, here you see the vine really encircling uh, their encounter. So there's a narrative power of the image that is perhaps also very playful and whimsical in that it plays with uh, what is graphic about the image uh, in itself and the decorative quality of it and, and, and brings it to life, brings uh, the story to life through these graphical elements that are also at times quite whimsical. Uh, 
we can see this in the use of battle standards and guns uh, in a very decorative manner uh, to indicate the Mita Dorma in, uh, in the Jaya Lankara Wulang. And this is an anthology or collection of uh, poems uh, that are about battles and, 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 and wars, right? Uh, so there is uh, a fairiness to those poems that are in many ways uh, that finds parallels in the way illustrations illustrations are used to divide uh, one poem from the next poems, which depict uh, and use the war equipments like cannons and flags uh, in a very graphic and stylized manner. Uh, uh, and therefore, converting or translating something that is perhaps uh, violent and conflictual and confrontational into some Thing that is almost uh, whimsical, but also in some sense spectacular. The way repetition is being used, uh, where you see the entire row of cannons being lined up uh, behind uh, the divisions of flags, uh, suggests some sense of order, but it also uh, conveys an idea that there's a theatrical dimension to this ceremony of display that you see being used and translated into a form of uh, il illustrated uh, decoration in a manuscript. Uh, and in other instances, uh, there are also the vodanas uh, that are being sort of uh, used to frame specific sections of the text. Uh, and they often take on an architectural quality uh, with many local architectural references being made, such as, for example, uh, the one you see in the middle, uh, the one on the left, uh, the, there's a graphic rendition of the tiered roof that we s spoke about just uh, earlier in the course, with uh, you know being surrounded by different types of vegetation and plant life, perhaps signifying a kind of like garden uh, associated with notions of the paradisal, where it is a space for some kind of like cultivation of wisdom. And then there's also visual references to uh, Hindu and Buddhist entrance portals with the arching Kalamakara motif used to extend the lintel of the door into a framing device as the Makara swoops downwards to serve as, you know, flanking guardians uh, 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 that is protecting uh, or, or guarding uh, the, the entrance passage. And finally, on the right side, what you see is a reference to also power animals uh, in the form of the lion and the crocodile flanking the gateway. And these are often recognized as karamats. Uh, that means they are animals connected or imbued with certain notion of sacrality or power uh, that can be appealed to uh, in order to gain certain favors. In all these instances, what you get a sense is that um, uh, the Bodhana in the Javanese uh, illustrated manuscripts uh, tend to take on a much more uh, visibly architectural quality, uh, referencing perhaps uh, very often its Hindu Buddhist or its present architectural tradition. Uh, uh, this cannot be often said about, uh, for example, Malay illuminated manuscript. However, I think that in many ways, the frames can be thought of in architectural terms. And, uh, and even though when the word architecture is used to describe the illuminated manuscripts, such as the short text that you have read earlier in the course by uh, Annabelle T. Gallup, uh, there, when we use the word architecture, it really in, uh, when she uses the word architecture, it really means that what is the principle or underlying the design of uh, the frames, right? But I think we can also use uh, architecture in the sense that uh, in what they're trying to portray is that they are in many ways portals, gateways, that facilitates our travel from one world to another world. Uh, that the book carries within it, you know, uh, and as a frame that allows you to enter into that world, it exists normally at 
the opening page and uh, chances are also the ending page uh, although that's not often the case uh, uh, in a lot of instances it's really in the opening page that you have this uh, opening passage way uh, so in summary when we think of tulis as an indigenous word uh, uh, where you get the word manulis or uh, the tulis uh, tulisan as uh, something that is about uh, the illustrating something through decorative means. Uh, we have also therefore an, an opportunity to really explore uh, what these terminologies tells us about the kinds of uh, uh, understanding or uh, the categories of art and aesthetic that was uh, prevalent in the Malay world prior to the introduction of uh, Western concepts and ideas of art uh, that is that has more commonly sort of like defined our understanding of art and our use of certain terminologies today. So, for example, the word seni uh, really is only used in classical Malay texts in a very precise sense to mean something being so small or so thin or fine, uh, uh, rather than its current meaning as art, such as seni lukis or seni acha or seni Islam. All these did not exist back then. Uh, so rather, we have words like hias uh, that retain its meaning today as decoration, uh, but also tulis, uh, which today means writing, but really is a form of illustration. Uh, the derivatives of which one gets a pata, uh, which is an image or a gamba, while reka is in some sense uh, in reference to how you compose a design. Then, if one makes a portrait of something or a representation of figure, one does create a lukisan. Or, however, chances are these are very rare in the past because of the prescription against these forms of uh, representational image making within uh, the religion of Islam. Uh, therefore, when one to list, one is often done in, and it is often done in an abstract or stylized manner, which produces uh, what is called the pola or the bunga bungaan or the awan, and these are terms that refers to modular pattern and its most basic design unit that is then replicable in a manner that is not uh, dissimilar to the. Uh, to the, to, the, to the Islamic aesthetic of the arabesque in that they are serialized, replicable, and infinitely extendable, uh, even outside of the pictorial field. Finally, in uh, manuscript tradition, there is also the frames or the jidar, which are then segmented into kandangs, and these are architectural in nature because they are portals or gateways that facilitate our travel from one world to another world, principally through the text. Uh, and the text is there to offer one the possibility of mental pictorial evocation uh, through the exercise of gambaran. So when we think of the gambar, it did not only exist in visual form, one thinks of also the auditory nature of the gambar alongside with the textual, alongside with the visual. So rather than think of them as discrete sort of fields of perception, I think we can think of them as interlinked and in conversation with one another. This is perhaps a more productive way to think of how the image uh, lives on and is remediated and is uh, expressed uh, uh, in the aesthetic traditions of the Malay world.